Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is, I think, my 110th more or less consecutive weekly economic outlook, a sort of uh, synthesis, synopsis of what, in my opinion, is and is not moving markets. Uh, well, first of all, this week, markets are moving, and uh, not just equity markets, but let's start with the equity markets. The week before last, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is, I suppose, the key measure, was down 4.6%. The broader S&P 500 was down 5.4%, and the tech-heavy Nasdaq was off 5.6%. Here in Europe, the uh, Cetradax in Germany was down 4.8%. The Cat 40 in Paris was off 4.6%, and our own FTSE 100, uh, which surprisingly has been outperforming its peers over the last uh, few weeks, was down 2.9%. Well, Asia was a bit different. The, the Nikkei 225, for instance, in Japan was actually up 0.2%, and Chinese markets were also up. But for most most markets, at least most markets in advanced economies, it was the worst week since January. And then it got worse. Last week, the Dow was down another 4.8%, leaving it down 17.1% year to date. The S&P was off 5.3%, which leaves it down 22% year to, year to date. And NASDAQ was down 4.8% or 30% year to date, despite a, a modest rally on Friday. Well, in Europe, it was much the same. The DAX was off 4.6% uh, for the week, or just over 17% year to date. The CAC was down 4.9% for the week and almost 18% year to date. And the FTSE 100 was off 4.1% for the week, or 5% for the year to date. The Nikkei is also off 10% year to date. These are big moves, and they mean that we're already in a bear market. And that, and that means that literally trillions of dollars are being vaporized from savings plans all over the world, from ISAs, from uh, SIPs, from 401ks, call them what you will. The full impact of this is only going to hit home over the next few weeks or months, but it isn't good news for anyone. And as I say, it isn't just equities. Last week, the FOMC, the US Federal Open Markets Committee, jacked official US interest rates up uh, by 75 basis points, pushing the federal funds rate up to a range of 150 to 175 in an effort to get ahead of the market. Although actually all it did was just uh, wet traders' appetite for at least another 75 basis points in July. Other central banks have had to follow, including the Swiss National Bank, which pushed its base rate up by 50 basis points, the first increase since 2007, followed by the Bank of Brazil, followed by the Hungarian Central Bank, and of course, by our own Bank of England, though the bank's MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, actually disappointed markets by only increasing UK rates by 25 basis points, even though that was the fifth consecutive monthly increase. Now, there were special circumstances around the Swiss action, which really spooked the markets, uh, in that the US Treasury had just issued a report accusing the Swiss of deliberately holding the Swiss franc down. And I'm sure that's the case, since the uh, Swiss authorities really don't want to encourage funk money from Russia and the Ukraine to pour into Switzerland. But the point is that almost everywhere, central banks are pushing rates up. I say almost everywhere because there are there are outliers, including both, including China and more surprisingly, I guess Russia, where Governor Nabiolina cut interest rates again two weeks ago, suggesting that the sanctions that we are imposing on Russia are perhaps not quite as effective as our political leaders uh, would like us to believe. And there's also Japan, where the Bank of Japan left interest rates unchanged last week at minus 0.1%, and even closer to home, the ECB, where Christine Lagarde talks tough, but carries a very small stick. 
There are special circumstances in both cases, but the general picture is, I think, one of central banks moving increasingly aggressively to push official rates higher. As a result, bond markets have basically tanked. Over the last two weeks, the yield on the two-year US Treasury note has risen from 3.07% to 3.19, while the 10-year, the benchmark 10-year yield has gone from 3.16 to 3.24. In Europe, the 10-year German Bund yield has risen from 1.52 to 1.66, while the 10-year UK gilt yield has gone from 245 to 250. Now, that doesn't sound so radical. Indeed, it isn't. But the two-year yield was about 125 basis points at the beginning of the year in the US, and the Bund yield was negative until a couple of months ago. And there's no relief in store, since there's little doubt that interest rates only have one way to go, and that is up. Foreign exchange markets have also been hit by instability, though I guess things are a bit different there since it's basically a zero-sum game. What one currency loses, another currency gains. In this case, the winner is very much the US dollar, which was up 0.5% on a trade-weighted basis last week and 9.1% year to date. But who are the losers? If you re read the papers, particularly the papers in the UK, you would assume that the biggest loser is sterling, which is indeed down 9.6% year to date against the dollar. But the euro is also down 7.7%. So against the euro, the pound is actually down rather less than 2%, which doesn't sound quite as apocalyptic as the Financial Times or even the Wall Street Journal would have one believe. In fact, the big loser has been the Japanese yen, which is actually down 17% against the dollar year to date, reflecting the Bank of Japan's reluctance to follow other central banks into raising interest rates. Eventually, the BOJ will have no choice, not least because the weak yen is already allowing inflation to creep in. But for now, it is the yen, not the pound, which is the weak link in the international currency chain. So what we have now is an equity route, a big bond market sell-off, and a flood of funk money looking for a safe haven into the dollar. Much of it, it's going into the dollar, if only for want of anything else. Now, not surprisingly, this has also hit crypto markets, which, in my opinion, were always how can I put it, a bull market buy, extremely vulnerable to a pushback in other markets, even if, uh, as it is said, 16 million Americans now own one cryptocurrency or another, thanks, to, thanks in large measure to the very cheap credit that they've been able to use to fund their habit. Now, I don't want to over-egg this, but I note that the value of the total cryptocurrency market has fallen by around 65% since last autumn. And unlike real markets, this is not a zero-sum game. It is estimated that at least $2 trillion uh, has been taken out of the market, and it could get worse. Bitcoin actually broke $18,000 on Saturday, hitting a low of 17600 Now, it's bounced back a bit since then, but the market as a whole is in panic mode with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US, threatening to go after Celsius, uh, which is one of the biggest lenders to the crypto traders, as a, calling it a shadow bank requiring regulation. And also, the SEC is targeting the stablecoin market, which is still smarting from the Terra USD slash Luna debacle over a couple of, of a three, three or four weeks ago. Now, I remember that the first time that I heard about Bitcoin, its worth was mm, roughly the same as a coffee in Starbucks. There will be bumps along the road and a lot of alleged buying opportunities, but we are heading that way again, particularly if interest rates continue to rise and those 16 million Americans are squeezed harder and harder. After all, they have to fund their debt and they will be squeezed.
interest rates will rise for two very good reasons. First of all, inflation, which is now at a 40-year high in most advanced economies. And secondly, the war in Ukraine, which is playing merry hell with any kind of fiscal restraint. Now, just a few words on the war. Anyone who's seen any of my videos over the last few months knows my view. Heretical, as it may seem, particularly in the UK, here in the UK, where Boris Johnson uh, reiterated last week after his flying visit to Kiev that we are in it for the long haul and that Ukraine must win and must be seen to win. A very commendable view. However, uh, my view in summary is, first of all, that whatever we might think or hope, the war is gradually turning in Russia's favor, and it will continue to do so until and unless we in the West commit resources on a scale that one dare hardly contemplate risking the nuclear escalation that Putin has been threatening. Secondly, that the cost to Ukraine in the loss of life, as well as the forced emigration and the economic pain that the country is enduring, is simply too much for what was always a poor and ill-managed country to bear. And thirdly, that the collateral damage is growing to North Africa in terms of food shortages and to Western Europe in terms of energy supplies. It's becoming ever increasingly obvious every day with each passing week. Of course, Putin is in the wrong and he should be punished. Of course, Zelensky is a hero, even if I seem to be the only one who remembers that he began his political life as the puppet of a rather distasteful Ukrainian-Israeli oligarch called Igor Kolomaisky. Uh, but I'm 100% with Henry Kissinger and the political realists who argue that Putin needs a way out and that such an off-ramp might require territorial concessions by Kiev. No surprise, therefore, that I was encouraged by the visit uh, that Messrs. Schultz, Macron and Draghi paid to Kiev last week, even if I was a bit puzzled as to what Romanian President Johannes was doing with them. I was also pleased that they are apparently sponsoring Ukraine's application to become a candidate country for EU membership, which is much less inflammatory and a lot more useful than the fantasy of NATO membership. Though it's worth emphasizing that candidate country is a very different status to actually being an EU member state. But the real question is, first of all, what concessions did they ask for from Zelensky? And secondly, did he agree? Or did he continue to insist, as he has done publicly, on a fight to the finish to re-establish Ukraine's pre-2014 territorial boundaries? I note that Schultz and Macron avoided giving Zelensky any binding commitments on heavy weapon shipments, which certainly increases the squeeze on him, as well as increasing Ukraine's dependence on Washington. But I also note that the US administration still seems, well, at least provided one believes that Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin still speaks for the administration, that suggests that uh, Washington is still determined to rub Putin's nose in his own shit. And I really don't know what the implications of the French election are going to be on Macron's policy with regard to Ukraine or indeed with regard to Russia. The fact that Marine Le Pen appears to have done surprisingly well could encourage Macron to seek some sort of deal given what Le Pen is said to be, uh, given that Le Pen is said to be pro-Russian, or he could dig his heels in either way. In the meantime, there were a couple of developments last week with regard to the war in Ukraine that have significant economic consequences. First, the US extended the carve out, which permits European buyers of Russian oil and gas to use the dollar-based international payment system. This was not entirely altruistic. US oil and gas exports to Europe have gone through the roof and are 
probably the main reason that US gasoline is now selling at five bucks a US gallon. That's rather less than a, a dollar a litre, but leave that aside. That's a political time bomb in ahead of the November elections in the US. And Biden, for one, would not be averse to Germany buying a bit more oil and gas from the Ruskies to keep the price of gas down, of gasoline down in the US. Second, Putin isn't playing ball on this. Last Tuesday, he announced that gas, natural gas shipments to Germany via the existing Nord Stream 1 pipeline would be cut by 40%. That's bad news, and it's already forced Schultz to announce that he will restart a number of coal-fired power plants. Some of those may even be lignite-powered, something that his green coalition partners, Anna Lena Baerbach and Robert Harbour, are going to find very, very difficult to swallow. In my opinion, expect a couple of resignations. Add to that the continuing failure of the Turkish initiative to guarantee safe passage through the Black Sea for Ukrainian food exports, which is pretty devastating for countries from Egypt to Morocco. And it's pretty clear, at least to me, that the war is extracting a very serious price, particularly for Central Europe and for the poorer Middle East and North African countries. Now, as for inflation, well, I, I don't see much, much good news on the horizon that would convince central banks to reorder their priorities. In the US, for instance, it was reported last week that the PPI, the producer price index, was up 10.8% year on year in May, the sixth consecutive month of rises above 10%. It was also reported that uh, consumers' inflationary expectations are continuing to rise, parche, despite what Paul Krugman may say in the New York Times, they were up last month from 6.3% to 6.6%. In Europe, it was also reported that the inflation rate for the Eurozone as a whole jumped from 74 to 8.1% in May, and that inflation is now running at 8.7% in Germany, where the wholesale price index was up almost 23% year on year last month. Now, things aren't quite as bad in France, where inflation is still just 5.8%. And even, even in Italy, where prices were up 7.3% year on year. But the direction of travel is very clear, as it is here in the UK, where the inflation rate is around 9% and set to rise to 11%, if, or perhaps more, if one believes the Bank of England. Obviously, things are different in Asia, though it's worth noting that uh, fresh food prices are now running at an annual inflation rate of over 12% in Japan. That's political dynamite there. In other words, Inflation is still the number one problem in most of the advanced countries. At the same time, however, it's increasingly clear that the global economy is slowing down and that Europe, at least, is teetering on the edge of recession. The situation in the US is a bit better, but it's still significant that the Wall Street Journal's regular quarterly poll of uh, Wall Street analysts finds that 40% of them now expect a recession, that's two quarters of negative growth, uh, by before the middle of next year. That's up from 28% in April and only 18% in January. According to the journal, a 40% reading in the past has been a 100% confident predictor of a recession around the corner. And there certainly is quite a lot of evidence that the combination of higher interest rates, higher energy prices, and decreasing consumer confidence is starting to hit the US economy. Last week, for instance, it was reported that US retail sales we're down 0.3% in May, that the Philadelphia Fed's manufacturing index fell from plus 2.6 to minus 3.3% this month, which is a big, a big drop, and that the conference board's consumer confidence index fell in May by 0.4%. 
There are, as always, counter indicators, and the US labor market is very, very tight, indeed astonishingly tight, with two vacancies for every job seeker. But the Fed's latest forecast is that US GDP this year will be up just 1.7%, down from a projection of 2.8% that it made in March, and it could be a lot worse than that. On this side of the Atlantic, well, the big economic news last week was also disappointing. At the Eurozone level, it was reported that the ZEW, the ZEW Economic Sentiment Index, came in at minus 28% in June, a horrendous figure, which is only marginally better than the <laughs> catastrophic figure of minus 29.5% in May. In Germany, it was even worse. The sentiment index fell to minus 28, with the current conditions sub-index at minus 27.6. Not good. Add to that the 0.3% fall in UK GDP in April after a fall of 0.1% in March. We are one of the very few countries in the world to try to calculate GDP on a month-to-month -month basis. And add in a 1.0%, a 1% drop in UK manufacturing. And it seems clear that the European economy writ large on both sides of the channel is heading for the rocks. Again, there are counter indicators, but the weight of evidence certainly suggests that recession, if not absolutely inevitable, is pretty damn close to inevitable. And it won't be helped by what's been happening in China, where Xi Jinping is apparently still incapable of appreciating that the COVID virus is not impressed with what the Politburo says. Last week, there were some positive signs, but the, the big news in China was probably the 6.7% year-on-year fall in retail sales last month, which leaves China facing the very real prospect of negative growth in the second quarter of the year. On top of this, we have the icing on the cake, political unheaval. Uh, upheaval, political upheaval. I've mentioned Macron. At this point, one can't be too definitive, but it does seem as though his uh, Renaissance Ensemble alliance um, will be around 45 seats short of the 289 seats that he needs for an outright majority in the National Assembly. Given that the uh, centre-right Républicain will have around 60 or 61 seats, he ought, he ought to be able to do a deal, but there will be a price. I'm not sure whom he will have to dump, but I guess Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire might be high up the list. As for Marine Le Pen, who's done better than expected, well, her Rassemblement National will end up with around 89 seats, apparently, which is, I guess, a modest triumph. But unless she can strike some sort of a deal with Jean-Luc Mélenchon's hard-left red-green Nupé coalition, she will be just a gadfly, as she has been for a long time. And given that the left still sees her as a sort of social pariah, that doesn't seem, the chance of a, of a rapprochement with the left doesn't seem likely, even if both the uh, RN and NUPES appeal to, uh, appeal to the same sort of um, France profonde. As for here in the UK, well, let's see what happens in Wakefield and Tiverton. Um, Boris Johnson isn't out of the woods yet, and I can't see that a summer of 1970s style inter industrial unrest and rampant inflation will help his cause, at least uh, not within the Tory ranks, though of course it might help the Conservatives against Labour if Labour decides to align with the unions on this. I should probably also mention Colombia, uh, where a 62-year-old former guerrilla Gustavo Petro has just beaten a 77-year-old property uh, magnate for the presidency in, of one of the very few remaining bastions of economic common sense in Latin America. And he's beaten him on a platform of increasing state intervention uh, modeled on Colombia's much less successful neighbors, Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. 
Why do they do it? Why do electorates that have benefited mightily from sensible centre-right economic policies dump their leaders in favour of adolescent radicalism? Uh, I guess to ask the question is to answer it. And that's it. Uh, I very much hope to see you again next week, but that's out of my hands. In any case, many thanks to you all for watching.